How was that? Yay. Yeah, isn't that fun? Isn't that amazing when you can put yourself in a space where you can just let go of everything that is or isn't supposed to happen? And you can just let the moment unfold. Not question, not judge yourself. Just be in the presence of this amazing experience of this incredible being called Jesus. And that's really what today is about. It's a celebration of an understanding of, all right, well, tell me, what did he do that was so amazing and incredible? And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a little bit of fun and talk about that because I think it's an amazing story and I think it's as, re as relevant today as it's ever been, ever. So Charles Fillmore thinks that Jesus' story is really simple when, you, when it comes right down to it. Fillmore believed that really what's happening with Jesus is he simply went from egoic consciousness, if you will, and stepped over into Christ consciousness, if you will. What he actually said was Jesus' teachings are based on the necessity of every person getting out of the five sensory mind or the egoic mind and entering into the kingdom of pure mind, the Christ mind or what we would call Christ consciousness. You see, the problem that we have isn't that we have an ego. I'm not a big person that believes like we have to destroy or kill the ego. Actually, I think the ego, when balanced, can actually help you out a lot in this third dimensional reality. And so my feeling is that it's not a matter of killing the ego, but it's a matter of quieting it and turning back into this thing right here, this heart, this indwelling piece of us that's connected to our divinity and connected to source or connected to God. And so this life that Jesus did, the example he gave us was going from totally egoic driven, 100% focusing on that, and then he moved over into Christ consciousness and turned into his heart. The heart, 5,000 times more powerful than your brain, scientifically proven. Anybody ever hear of heart math? Yeah, heart math. It's a process where you actually tune into your heart. And then you start functioning, making your decisions, and living your life out of your heart versus your head. This is where we always want to go. We want to go into the brain. The ego wants you to go there. We were taught, we were believed, we were trained, we were conditioned to live out of our heads, not our hearts. We're starting to wake up a little bit. Some people have finally figured it out. And now we're starting to make that transition from over here to over here. Jesus was the way shower, the master teacher, and embodied perfection. And I would say that that embodied perfection was actually the embodiment of both perfection and imperfection. Yeah, all of it. Because we are all of it. We are perfection, and yet we are imperfection. It's this beautiful dichotomy. It's this catch-22 that we find ourselves in that we're living as the Christ, and yet we're living in a third-dimensional reality, and it's all divine, all of it. We are the perfection, and we are the imperfection. We are both but if we get caught in our egoic mind, what our egoic mind will tell us is, well, you can't be divine. How can you be divine? Look at, look at you. Look at your life. What a mess. You can't think yourself or call yourself divine, can you? And what I'm sharing with you this morning is I'm telling you, that Jesus, one of the great things he was able to do is he was able to stand there and said, you better believe it. I am all of it. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Isn't that what he said? I think so. That's exactly what he said. 
He was the master teacher. He perfectly understood his divine nature. I think one of the cool things about unity is that when it talks about Jesus, it actually has three ways of understanding Jesus. And as I went through my studies in the ministerial program, it became more and more clear to me. It's pretty cool, actually. So, number one, we have this human being called Jesus. Lived 33 years on this planet, the Nazarene. He was the son of Joseph. Joseph. So, we've got three parts or three understandings. Number one, there was the human being called Jesus, right? Number two, we have this thing that's called Jesus the Christ. That is actually not the human being called Jesus. It is the divine idea of perfection. It's the perfect thing that we think about when we think of the Christ, this absolute perfection, but it's an idea. It's actually not him. The third one, is Christ Jesus. This is the ascended man who became Jesus Christ. Christ Jesus, the anointed one, the perfect pattern or the idea. And what I love about that is it just helps me understand him on a much deeper level. And I appreciate it much, much more. Especially as, like you, I'm going through my own spiritual journey, my own spiritual awakening. I'm understanding things on a deeper level. And what I realize is it's not quite as simple as I once understood it when I was younger. A little bit more complex, a little bit more stuff going on. Now, don't take me wrong, it can be easy. It doesn't have to be complicated. But can also be deeper, if you will. Because my understanding has changed. My understanding I have today wasn't the same as it was when I was a fundamentalist and I was 12 years old. Anybody else's understanding of Jesus change over time? Yeah, maybe one or two of us, right? Like many of you, I used to have a more traditional view of Jesus. For example, I used to believe that Jesus was the only son the only son of God. I used to believe that he died for my sins. I used to believe that I needed to accept him as my savior in order to go to heaven. And if I didn't, I guess I would spend all of eternity in hell. I used to believe that him and God were outside of myself and lived in a place called heaven. Anybody been there? Anybody? A few. It's all good, folks. All of it is good. Our own journeys are absolutely what we needed to experience. So when I talk about this stuff, I want you to understand something. I am not judging that teaching and that understanding in any way, shape, or form because I chose to go through that so I could understand something on a different level. Right? As I shared with you a few weeks ago, when I started to attend Unity and started to study metaphysics, my understanding obviously completely changed about who Jesus was, his message, and really what he represented. With Unity, the gift is that I realized that Jesus wasn't the only son of God that really what Jesus was telling us is that we are all the sons and daughters of God, of the divine. We all are, not just him. Didn't he say that you too shall do greater things than I? Yes, he did. That's what he said. What his real message was trying to tell us is that we all have within us the same thing that he did. That's what he was telling us, that inside we're made of the same stuff. That we are all unique expressions of the divine. All of us. Yes, you. Yes, you. Yes, you. All of you. All of us are a unique expression of the divine. The only difference is Jesus didn't hide that. Jesus didn't deny that. Jesus accepted it, he embraced it, and then he shared it. That's what he did. 
That's what makes his story so amazing and so powerful. Think about that for a minute. The difference of your life if you could do that. If you could take away all that conditioning, all that garbage that we picked up from our parents and our teachers and our preachers and all that stuff, and we said, enough. I'm going to stand here, right here and now, and I'm going to accept and embrace my own divinity just like he did. And others, by the way, yes, there are others that did the same exact thing. In unity, what I realized is that by going through the process of his resurrection, that is a spiritual process that we all go through. Jesus showed us that there was a way that if we would follow, would return us to the full and complete connection to God and to our own divinity. Because that's kind of what he did. He walked around every single day in every single way, staying connected with himself, connected with God, and he lived his life. And he decided, he made the decision that the greatest thing that he could do is to share that experience with everybody else. And it looked like a lot of different things that he did. It wasn't just one thing, it was many things that he did. And it looked differently. Kind of like you look different, and you look different, and you look different, and you look different. Kind of like that. So imagine, if you will, there was different expressions. The only thing is, Jesus knew what his expression was. And he knew and stepped into it. And I've said this many, many times, that can look differently for every single one of you. And you know what? It's beautiful. It's priceless. And the world is waiting for you just to show up and be you, this amazing light, in your own way. And it doesn't have to be big and bold. It can be small and quiet. It's a limitless expression that we all have the opportunity to express. How cool is that? Isn't that fun? Take the pressure off a little bit? You mean it doesn't need to look like this? No, it doesn't. It needs to look like you. That's what it needs to look like. That's exactly what it needs to look like. With unity, I realize that in truth, it wasn't about accepting him as my Lord and personal Savior. The message Jesus was really sharing, we talked about last week a little bit, and that was I needed to accept, acknowledge, and embrace my own indwelling Christ within myself. Notice I didn't say outside of myself. Notice I didn't say I needed to look at somebody else and accept their divinity. I needed to look within myself and accept my own divinity. A little bit of a different story. A little bit of a different twist. A different way of looking at things. Because that's what happens. In the traditional view, we have a tendency to look outside of ourselves and say, oh, well, he's got it, not me. And I promise you, if he was standing here, right here and right now, Jesus would look at you and smile and say, it's really not about me. It's about you and your connection to source, your connection to God. Yeah, he was an amazing teacher, master, did miraculous things. But it's about our own journey and the ability for us to say yes to that thing inside of ourselves. In unity, I realized that hell is a state of mind that we create in our own lives. Not at some point in the future, but right here, right now. How many people have ever lived in hell for a while in this lifetime? I know I have, without a doubt. It had nothing to do with what was going to happen after I died. I created it in my own life. Silly. Silly. Not necessary. Don't suggest going there. Don't. It's not fun. 
But I think we do that. I think we create hell in our own lives. But if I follow Jesus' example, I can actually experience just the opposite, opposite of that. I can experience something called heaven. And what unity taught me was heaven isn't something out there. Again, heaven and hell are both states of mind. Heaven is a state of mind that you can attain right here, right now. Not when I die. I can actually have it here and now. That is possible. Very possible. With unity, I realized that actually I'm a co-creator with God. And through my thoughts, my words, and my actions, that I'm not a victim. I can tell you probably the greatest difference in my life is I've stepped out of this idea that I'm a victim, that everything's happening to me without any say or input, and thinking, woe is me. That was the old Mike. The new Mike steps over here and knows that within myself, I am a powerful creator. I am a powerful co-creator with the divine. One with God, co-creator. I am no longer a victim. I promise you, when you live your life from the place of not being a victim, but as a powerful creator, your life will change. It'll change. And the only thing it takes is for you to make that decision. Nobody is going to come down from heaven and anoint you and say, there you go. That anointment happens to yourself from yourself. You are the one who does that. My own story is I sat there and waited, and I 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 waited. Guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. What started to change for me when all of a sudden I said, oh, wait a minute, you mean I got to participate in this? Yes. I've got to engage with my divinity? Yes. I've got to step back into my power and claim that for myself? Yes. Why? Because who am I? I am divine. I am powerful. And the universe, the world, is going to respond to you according to the way that you step into that co-creative space. And if you decide you're a victim, then guess what the universe is going to do? It's going to show you a lot of victim. That's what it's going to do. Guess what happens, though, if you make a different decision and you decide to be a powerful creator? Hmm. You mean, you mean I can do either one? Yes. You can do either one. It's a choice, folks. It's a choice. And there's no judgment. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's no good. There's no bad. Nobody is going to judge you for either one of them. My life experience has been... I like the party over here a lot more when I'm being a creator than I liked being over here when I was a victim. Anybody else been there? Yeah. Yeah. And it's a choice. Right? In no way, shape, or form does anything I just said take anything away from Jesus' story that we love. doesn't. In fact, if anything, it makes me love him even more than I ever have. Because again, as I continue on my own journey and unfoldment, I'm now understanding what it must have been like for him to go through everything he went through in his life. And I'll share something with you. That this day is a celebration of when Jesus resurrected and then went on. And a lot of people think that that was it, and he was gone and out of here. But I'm going to tell you something. My experience and my knowing, if anything, has showed me not only is he not gone, <laughs> but, but he's shown up in so many different ways that it blows my mind. Some examples of that. How many people are Course in Miracles fans? There's a few of you out there. Oh, yeah. 
How many people have ever read The Course in Love? A few of you? Mm -hmm. How many have ever read The Way of Mastery? Yeah, a few. Those are a few examples. And folks, I'm not talking about a one-page book. If you look at any of those, you will see those books are this thick with a way, with a process of returning to your divinity that's extremely detailed. And yet the energy coming off of those books, off of those teachings, off of that material, I will tell you as somebody who has experienced them, is unmatched with its power, its love, and its devotion. They're beautiful. And what I'm going to tell you is nothing has gone away. Jesus hasn't gone anywhere. If anything, he's there. And if that teachings, those teachings resonate with you, you can tie into that stuff and make it as real as you want to make it. Make it as real as our meditation this morning. You know, I really do believe that if you look at the entire story of the resurrection, it can be a great analogy for life. In other words, when you really look at it, the Holy Week, the last week of Jesus' life, it reflects life in all of its ups and downs. I want to share with you this morning something that was written that I read from Cardinal Timothy Dolan in New York that I think explains it perfectly. And what he says is, in the story, there's a lot of ups and downs, lights and darkness, life and death, this week that we claim to be holy, a stew of seemingly contradictory ingredients from the height of Palm Sunday with acclamations of faith in Jesus as a long-awaited son of David to the rant of the worked-up rabble on Good Friday, crucify him. From the raised palms of victory, greeting Jesus, seated on a donkey, to the raised fists demanding his torture and death the following Friday. From the warmth of the fraternal meal at what would be his last supper on Holy Thursday, to the anguish of blood, sweat, and tears only hours later in his agony in the garden as one of his dinner guests betrays him, all the others but one abandoned him, and the leader he had appointed denied him three times. From the misery, defeat, and death on that Friday, weirdly called good, when the sun hid and darkness covered the earth, to his radiant resurrection after three days. Faith to doubt, to faith again, joy to sorrow, to jubilation again, good to evil, back to good, life to death, and a return to life. Victory to defeat, to triumph again. Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. Is it bizarre? Is it a tease? Or is it a reflection of what this life has for all of us? For are not these days on earth just such a mixture of both joy and sadness? We seem to weave from health to sickness, peace to war, flourishing to adversity, and then finally, death to eternal life. Have we not sensed that during COVID? Sickness, isolation, fear, death, all heroism of so many and eventually recovering? Do we not watch that in the Ukraine right now? A vicious, unjust attack on the innocent babies blown up and refugees in the millions, but a people of resilience and grit uniting the world with neighbors formerly at times suspicious of one another, now embracing and aiding these, these flee, the people that are fleeing. He goes on to talk about his Jewish friends, how they would tell him that this mixture of joy and sadness is central to Passover as well. A meal with both bitterness and sweetness, memories of oppression mixed with home and the reality of liberation. Palm Sunday is celebrated on the last Sunday before Easter for the triumphant entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem and memory of palm branches were placed on his path. And in fact, by the way, as a reminder, we do have palms to pass out for you. And I'm going to ask you to take one when you exit the talk today. So in life, yes, there's ups and downs. This Holy Week, this Passover, 
these years on earth. But remember, Easter has the last word. Life, not death. Good, not evil. Smiles, not tears. Victory, not defeat, has the last word. And as I think about this, I think about my own life and what's going on in my own spiritual journey. And so I'm going to close with just asking you a few questions about your spiritual journey and where you're at in this process called life, in this process called spiritual awakening, in this process of your own spiritual journey. Are you feeling like Jesus riding in on the donkey on Palm Sunday? Is that where you're at? Are you feeling the unrest, the chaos, and confusion, and in fear as you look all around you, your life and the world that we live in? Are you feeling like you're being pinned up on the cross, unjustly accused of doing something you didn't do? Are you resting now? Have you gone through the dark night of the soul, and now you're just resting and waiting? Or have you been reborn? And now is the time of, time of great jubilation, celebrating having made it through to the other side. Every single part of your spiritual journey, folks, we do them all, often many, many times in our life. There's no better than or less than. They all serve a purpose. You are exactly where you need to be for your own spiritual awakening. What's showing up for you, what life is showing you right here, right now, is exactly what is needed from the relationships you have to the jobs that you're doing to the people you're playing with or the people you're fighting with or the situations that are going on either individually or collectively, whether they're happening inside of this church or in the world. They are all perfect for your own unfoldment. I've shared this with you that my wife and I are in the process of moving. And if you were going to ask me, Mike, where are you at in your own journey? Where do you stand? I would have to say that I'm kind of in that phase of chaos and a little bit of confusion. We're moving. We just moved Ada into Walker. We're going to be moving from Walker over to Cascade. I got a new computer. And there's a part of me that really does understand, like, this is going to be leading to a really cool spot. Like, I know eventually it's going to be amazing. I have that trust and knowing that that is the truth. I would be lying through my teeth if I sat there and told you that every single part of this process has been a great, joyful experience because the truth is it hasn't been because I'm human. I've got that part of me that sits there and questions. I got that part of me that's not sure. I got that part of me that wants to know what on God's green earth are you doing? That's the human part of Mike. And I would have a tendency to believe that if it's happening inside of me, there might be one or two people here that are listening to this going, oh yeah. Right? And so, what do I do with that? I go back to the lessons. I go back to Jesus. And I look at his story. Because if it's the one thing, and I would say it's more than just one thing, that I so appreciate about his journey is if you really think about it, during all of it, he never let go of who he was. Whether he was riding on the donkey or he was getting pinned on the cross, what did he maintain? Peace, love, compassion. He didn't resist any of it. He didn't judge any of it. And he realized that everything that was happening was for his own spiritual awakening and growth. Wow, you've got to be kidding me. Like, I think the donkey part would have been pretty easy. Let's face it, you're on a donkey, you're riding in, everybody's going, whoa, hey, look at you. But I don't think that's the case when he was getting pinned on the cross. I just don't. 
And yet there he was because he knew who and what he was. He knew he, who he was connected to and he knew that it was a process that he needed to go through. And then he did it. He was able to forgive the man who nailed his hands to the cross. When he was up there, he was able to look at the person next to him, the thief, and forgive him and bless him. He was still being him, even though everything around him was in complete chaos and turmoil. This powerful expression, the embodiment of his own divinity, he embodied it with love, with compassion, with forgiveness, all of them. In the way of mastery, Jesus quotes, in terms of defining mastery, mastery is a state in which you have embraced yourself as a ceaseless creator and assumed complete responsibility for everything that comes into the field of your awareness without judging it, so that you can simply decide whether it's going to stay or whether you're going to change it. But in order to stand in that space, you have to understand and remember who you are. And for me, Jesus was the ultimate example and reminder of who I am. And my hope and prayer for you this Easter Sunday is that when you get to spend a little bit of time alone, maybe you have a little time where you can sit down and think about what I said today and do what Jesus did, which was embrace, fully embrace and accept his own divinity. I don't think there could be any higher way to honor him, his life, and his legacy. I love you all. I bless you all. I'm grateful for you all. You make a difference in my life, and I want you to know that. Have a great Easter Sunday. God bless.